We noted last Sunday evening that life is built upon relationships. We have all kind of relationships in our life. And it's important that we see what the Bible has to say about these relationships. And the book of Romans is filled with information concerning our relationships. In chapter 5, verse number 6, Paul is going to explain to us how God relates to man. Romans 5, verse 6, When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul explains to us how God relates to humanity when we could do nothing. Totally undone, totally lost, Nothing we could do to save ourselves in Romans 5, verse 6. That's what he means when he says, when we were without strength, powerless, nothing we could do when we were yet without strength in due time. Galatians 4, verse 4 said, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, right at the exact moment in history that God had planned from eternity, right at the exact moment which was the best time, in due time, Romans 5, 6, Christ died for the ungodly. God loves us so much, in verse 8, He has shown us that love, not simply spoken about that love, but He has shown us that love by giving His Son for us. So that's the way God relates to us. And then in chapter 6, we noted one of the most important lessons in Romans that he gives to the Roman church is how Christians are to relate to sin. We have become God's people, yet we live in a sinful world. We are surrounded by sin every day that we live, and yet we are God's children. How should we relate to this sinful environment? Romans 6, verse number 1. What do we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Do we just keep living the same way we were living before we were Christians? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. Then in verse number 11, Paul says, Likewise, consider yourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof, verse number 12. And then verse number 14, God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Paul explains we no longer live the same life we lived before we were Christians. We have died to that life. That life has been put to death. It has been buried with Christ in baptism. And in verse number 5, we were raised to live a new life. 
a new life because the old life has been destroyed. It has been repudiated. We now belong to God. Everything is now different. Paul explains, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God be thanked, you were servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Then, verse 17 and 18, you were made free from sin. So sin has been put to death in our lives. We have been freed from that bondage. Before we were Christians, we were bonded. We were slaves to sin. Then in chapter 7, he explains our relation to mere law. This is law without Christ on the cross. This is law, mere law, which all law can do in and of itself is show you that you are in sin. Mere law can't do anything about that sin. Thus, no one could be saved just by a mere law. Law cannot save. Therefore, he explains the position of a person that was under the Mosaic Covenant in chapter 7. And in verse number 24, he explains the condition using himself as an example, Romans 7, verse number 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You are under a law that cannot take away your sins. Without Christ on the cross, no way to be saved. No one could keep that law perfectly, thus no one could earn God's salvation. Thus, under that condition, Paul explained in verse 24, it's a wretched condition. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Verse number 25, Romans 7, 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he explained about our relationship to the flesh in chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law, verse 4, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 5, They that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Then in verse number 13, he says, If you live after the flesh, you will die spiritually. If you live just according to the appetites of your flesh, you are separated from God. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you shall live. For to be spiritually minded, that's life and peace. To be carnally minded is death, separation from God. But if we follow as the Holy Spirit speaks to us through His divine Word, if we follow that Word and put to death the deeds of the flesh, then we have life in the Lord. That's our relationship to the flesh. Then in chapter 9, what is our relationship to the lost? 
this is an important question because as children of God, we find ourselves surrounded by those who are lost. Those who do not understand, do not comprehend our way of life, our way of worship, our way of living, our way of thinking. They simply cannot comprehend it. Do we have a responsibility toward them? What is our, to be our relationship with lost people? Romans chapter 9, verse number 1, Paul says, I tell you the truth, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and sorrow in my heart. Why did he have great heaviness and sorrow in his heart? Verse 3, for my kinsmen, my brethren in the flesh. He said, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for them. Not that this could happen. We cannot be responsible for someone else's life. But he says, I love them so much, and I'm so sorry that they are lost, that I could give up my life in Christ if it would cause them to be saved. Now, it wouldn't, but he said, if it would, I would be willing to be a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen in the flesh. Then in verse number 4, he tells us who he's talking about, Romans 9, 4, the Israelites. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but racially he was an Israelite. That was his people. This was his great sorrow in his heart. This was his heaviness that these people wouldn't accept the gospel. People that he loved would not accept the truth. So he had a great heaviness in his heart, a great sorrow in his heart for these people. Chapter 10, verse 1, he takes up the same subject. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1, same subject. He said, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Paul prayed for these people. But he didn't just pray for them. He taught them every opportunity that came his way. He tried everything that he could do to save these people, not just say prayer for them. That's not enough. He did pray for them, but he also did everything that he could to take the gospel to these people. Back in chapter 1 and verse number 14, notice his attitude. I am debtor to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, to the unwise. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel to those of you who are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul felt an obligation to lost people. Is it possible modern Christians somehow, some way through the years have lost that sense of obligation to take God's precious message to all of those who are lost? If someone had a cure for cancer and wouldn't share it with the world, we would say they were a monster. The Lord's church has the cure to the greatest problem of all mankind. Sin. We have the answer to that problem. If we just keep it within ourselves, what kind of people are we? 
the whole world is lost and, and sliding into a devil's hell. Some are not interested. They're more interested in their money. They're more interested in their materialism. They're more interested in their power. They're more interested in anything but that, in their entertainment. They're not interested in the lost people. Our relationship to lost people should be a burning desire that we do everything within our power to save them. Everyone cannot teach a Bible class. Everyone cannot teach a personal work class. Everyone cannot do that. God has distributed talents among us as He sees fit. We can't all do the same thing. And we're not all commanded to do the same thing. Some preachers are so stinking ignorant, they think if you don't do it their way, then you're not doing God's work. Well, everybody has a work to do. And we all don't have to do it in the same way. We don't all have to knock doors. We don't all have to sit down and teach Bible lessons. We do what we have with what God has given to us. We give and use the talents God has given to us. There are many ways to teach lost people. Not only one way. There are many ways to bring the lost to Christ. Not simply one way that one preacher thinks. There are many different ways. And God's people must use every way that is available to do all that we can to save lost people because our relationship to the lost should be love, concern, obligation. What is our relationship to our fellow man? Do we have, or do we have any responsibility what should that relationship be? Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18 says, If it be possible, not always possible because some people won't like you if you tell them the truth, but if it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all Maybe some people don't want to be at peace with you. You can't make them. You can't make people like you. You can't make people be at peace. But you better be sure you have done all you can do as much as lieth within you, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. What is our relationship supposed to be to the world? We all have to live in the world. Jesus lived in this world. The apostles lived in this world. The early church was in the world. How did they relate to the world? What was their relationship to the world? Did they just shun everybody and let everybody know we're better than you? And we have no patience in dealing with you. You're ignorant. You should know those things. Is that the way the early church? Is that the way they perform? Is that the way Jesus Christ acted? What is our relationship? Number one, we love their souls. No matter what is the nature of their sin, no matter how bad their sin may be, we love their souls. It's worth one soul is worth all of the world. So we care about them deeply. And yet, notice Romans 12 too. What is to be our relationship to the world? Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Yes, we must love them. We must share the truth with them. We must live an exemplary life in front of them. We must be kind. 
We must be patient with people who are lost. And yet, we have this responsibility. We cannot become conformed to the standards of this world. We cannot allow this world to squeeze us into its mold. The reason they don't understand us, the reason many times they are hostile toward us, sometimes is because we are hypocritical and they see that. Sometimes it is because we are not living an exemplary life in front of them. And so they think that we're hypocrites. They have a justifiable reason to feel hostility in those cases. And yet sometimes there is going to be hostility simply because of what we believe. Simply because we are living for Christ, there is going to be hostility simply because we are different. You ever notice when people are different, it kind of bothers people? I notice that all my life. I guess that's why I always kind of wanted to be different. Anything that's different, if you talk different, you got a different access, a, a, a accent, the way you talk, if it's different, if you look different, if you don't do everything just like everybody else, people kind of shy away from you. So there is a sense of hostility that comes to the church from the world because they cannot understand the differences between us and them. And they have a desire to make us to become like them. And when we refuse, they are angry. What would you expect? Of course they are angry. They do not understand. They cannot understand. But we cannot allow them to force their standards of morality upon us. We cannot allow them to make us act like they act and think the way that they think. We must be different. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Come out from among them. Be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing." and I will receive you, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. We have to come out. Is that not what he told his children in Babylon? When he said to come out from Babylon, that meant more than just physical location. That meant come out of their worldliness. Come out of their false religion. Come out of their false way of thinking. We don't have to think like the world. We don't have to be like them. Chapter, last part of chapter 12. What should be my relationship toward an enemy? Some of you think that there are people in this audience that are your enemy even though they're your brethren. What should your attitude be? What, 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 how should you relate to those people? Well, Paul explains in the latter part of chapter 12, avenge not yourselves. Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, thus saith the Lord. And then the last verse of chapter 12, don't, become, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good, the very last verse of chapter 12. Then in chapter 13, he's going to tell us our relationship to government. This is a nice thing to talk about since we're 
fixing to have a wonderful, exciting election. And if you think it's wonderful and exciting that I got some oceanfront property way back in East Texas to sell you, we're in the midst of an election. What is our responsibility to government? Romans 13 discusses this in a very, very clear manner. Paul explains in Romans 13, 1 through 4, that government was established by God, not by man. It was God's desire that there be government in the world. So when you resist government, you're resisting the ordinance of God. Because God is the one who brought government government to the world now that doesn't mean that God approves of abuses of government there are many governments including our own that have many abuses God doesn't approve of that generally he says a government will reward good living and people who do what is right. That's a general concept. It doesn't apply in every place. Some governments are corrupt. But even the corrupt Roman government, generally, this would be the case. And he explains in verse number 4 that when people are evildoers, it is the place of the government to punish them. He said, they bear not the sword in vain. Now, many people don't agree, and that's fine. Study this for yourself. But it would seem to me that Romans 13, 1 through 4, teaches clearly that our government, not me, but my government, has the right to use capital punishment. They have the right to take people who are so evil, who do so many atrocities in our land, who murder so many people, my government has the right to put those people to death. Romans 13, 4 says they are the minister of God. That means servant. That doesn't mean preacher. Minister just means servant. They are God's servant to execute His wrath on people who are evil and they have the right to bear the sword. Now, when the Roman government would bear the sword, it wasn't a rubber sword. It wasn't a play sword. It meant death. When they bore the sword against an individual, it meant death. Do you know how the Romans executed people? with the sword. Therefore, Paul is saying government has the right to do that. It is not cruel and unusual punishment. It is the wrath of God against people who are evil. And what's Paul's point in Romans 13? We should submit to government. Now there is one exception. Acts 5, 29. When the government contradicts the Bible, when the government contradicts the law of God, we must choose the law of God. And that's what you have in Acts 5, 29. And you know what Peter said? Peter and the other apostles answered the governing officials and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. When it comes to a choice between obeying what God says and any man, I don't care who he is or what power he thinks he has, when it comes to a choice between obeying God and man, our choice is clear. We must obey God. And that's where all beauty in life begins. All beautiful relationships begin when we obey God in becoming Christian. 
in repenting of our sins and being immersed to have those sins forgiven, that's when all the beauty begins in living for God. And you can do that now while we stand and while we sing.